active duty service members, veterans, family members, thank you for your service. And thank you for listening to Return to Roots Mildevet Resource Podcast, where we document our shared experiences, stories, and transitioning and reintegrating from the military to the community. Hosted by two transitioning service members, myself, Chris Elder, and my partner in crime, Jonathan Hernandez. For more information, go to mill2vet.com. If you have little ears, ensure you listen to the content before you allow them to listen. And if you are in crisis and homelessness, suicide ideations, or incarceration, dial 211, Courage to Call for assistance. Now, stand by for the sound of freedom. Return to Roots fam, welcome to the show. Today, veteran Will Liu from the United States Navy will be joining us to talk about the Veterans Beer Club. This organization was started here in San Diego and now has become a national sensation. Without further ado, Will, welcome to the show. Today, we are honored to have you here uh, and talk about the Veterans Brewing Club. Can you tell us a little bit of history behind that before we get started with you? Yeah. So I'm uh, three years into the San Diego uh, Veterans Beer Club. Uh, since, since we've been around for about seven years now, recently had the anniversary back in June, but uh, we have chapters nationwide. I'd like to say the San Diego uh, chapter is the biggest one out of all chapters, but ultimately the theme is just, we're trying to create meaningful connections within our members and within the community. So we're trying to get away from these formal networking events that you might see where you have to dress business casual, bring a resume. Um, these are just meant to be show up, come as yourself, make some meaningful connections. There's no real agenda minus our group picture, but it's just meant to be focused on making meaningful connections and kind of bring that camaraderie that you get within the military um, that you may not necessarily get outside of the military once when, you transition out. So we're trying to bridge that gap between uh, bringing people together where they need it the most. Perfect. So now tell us, how did you get started three years ago with them? Yeah. Uh, I actually started as a member, uh, kind of the long, I'll try to do like a long, short, long story, but uh, transition out in 2017. Uh, I think like many people, you get the advice of, hey, you gotta go network, but then no one, no one ever says, what does that mean? What do you do? Um, I use Veterati a lot. That's something that probably you might be familiar with, but it's like an online mentorship platform. Uh, Phil Kendro, one of the original founders of the San Diego chapter, who's on the national team now, uh, had networking as one of the little bullet points on his profile. So I thought, great, um, Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he, he can probably teach me how to network. So we scheduled a call, and I think the main topic was, hey, uh, I know I'm supposed to network, but I don't know what I'm doing. You know, teach me what to do, what do I say? And he was like, well, I host this monthly. Uh, event at breweries to connect veterans together and it's in two hours can you can you make it so showed up first event um met met this guy booz allen uh marine corps veteran and ended up being this the person who got me into my first job did the uh, mock interviews uh resume like resume revision uh salary negotiation was through him as well but since then as a member, when I was at Booz Allen, I was kind of that bridge of, hey, if you're interested, you know, I can do, I can bring you in, do referrals. And eventually, as the San Diego chapter wanted to advance and grow, um, the original founders, Phil Bryan and Kevin, uh, went to the national level. And then uh, Joe Sandra and I took over the San Diego chapter. And then since then, we've been growing. Um, I mean, we're doing, 60 to 70 people in the event, but uh, yeah, it, it's definitely come full circle from member to the chapter lead. So I was able to attend a, a VBC uh, right before I left San Diego and it was a really cool event. 
you guys have uh, um, the brewery set up and you guys changed different breweries if I'm not mistaken but the one I was at they had a food truck there and um, then yeah the group photo the mandatory uh, fun shot yeah. uh, no it was really great because even though it was kind of weird for me because I didn't know anybody there until I started like people would just come up to me and just talk to me yeah and it was really refreshing because you know like hey I got all these other things going on and literally I could go to this place um partake in a beverage um and meet some other uh brothers and sisters there my particular beverage is water but hey okay yeah no. it's it still a good time um they they um uh, it there was a lot of people there that just wanted to connect with you and a ton of opportunities that that were there uh people with job opportunities people talking about uh markets that were opening up like hey there's so many jobs that show up to these and um it i've been to the nav met breakfast which i'm sure you probably also have attended but the vbc also brought that kind of nav met aspect but a little bit less uh, formal. So you didn't have to like dress in your Sunday best and show mm -hmm. up, which you could talk to Yogi. I'm always kind of showing up in a t-shirt and flip-flops anyway. <laughs> That's San Diego formal. So you're, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's really refreshing. And there's so many people there that are just want to want to have a great conversation talk about the transition talk about job opportunities talk about uh i met recruiters there i met college recruiters um even you know there's a there's a i met a nuclear recruiter there who was recruiting all the nukes out of there a uh, whole bunch of different uh categories special op type people were there uh recruiting for more sf stuff um, like there's just so many different wickets. If you want a job at uh, Booz Allen, there's a Booz Allen guy there. Just so many different uh, people there. So that that was a really awesome opportunity. And then you know people would stand there and say, "Hey, I have a job opportunity," and then they would talk about the different opportunities that were going on. So that that was really really well well done. So great and, job. And that's the hope. I think for me the value is that human connection because you're going from looking online and seeing this job posting, uh, sending a resume or clicking apply wondering, well, I, I hope it gets through or I hope someone reads this, but I think part of the benefit with these events is that you have someone, like you have someone talking about the company culture, talking about what their experience is, what to put in your resume, Where's the company going? You you have a point of contact and you had that human element. And I think that's a big benefit for anyone who's transitioning, for anyone who's looking for that next role, but having that extra connection, that person inside who knows how that particular company works, I think is a big benefit. What was some of the biggest um, takeaways when you were at VBC, what were some of the biggest takeaways that you've seen while you've attended it? Like some of the, give me some of the awesome success stories that you've seen out of VBC. Some of the most, let's see, some of the success stories that I've seen. Um, I know I've met a couple of people who weren't looking for jobs, but were buying, buying their first home don't know who to trust because do I pick a real estate agent off of Facebook or do I find someone online and through connections, they found, uh, I think a lender, a real estate agent for a home. Um, I've seen people get connected with grad school opportunities. So I know UCSD, SDSU, um, put low and Nazarene regularly shows up and we have people helping connect for, um, one another for grad school opportunities, for undergraduate opportunities. Um, I've seen military spouses get connected with roles. Uh, one of our newly, new chapter leads who's doing the military spouse uh, portion of the, of the program or of the chapter uh, works at Lockheed and has been actively referring other spouses 
So bridging that gap with referrals. Um, I think one of the more memorable one, most recent ones that came out of the anniversary event was last year, we had this partnership with the Ivy League Plus group of San Diego. So think um, MIT, Stanford, Dartmouth, Columbia, Cornell. And she met a mentor that is not former military, but just wanted to help. And, and it's been over a year and they're still, they're, they're still chatting, they're still connected. He, um, that particular person still providing mentorship and it all came from BBC. So it's just these moments of serendipity, I guess, where the connection would have ne not necessarily happened if it wasn't for these events. So with that, tell us about the growth. Where has, you mentioned earlier that he went from just a local club here in San Diego to now it's nationwide. What other, what states is it located up? What is the growth? What if, and then we'll talk about if someone wanted to become and open up their own chapter in a different state or a different city, how would that work? What would be the process? Yeah. So I think one of the perks of the military is you get to travel. So like many uh, members of BBC that attend an event, travel, move, they, they see a need and they want to fix it. So oftentimes uh, we'll have a, a member or attendee who, who, who does a PCS and then thinks, wait, why, do, why doesn't my location or my city have a, a chapter? Uh, since then, just off the top of my head, uh, I, there's like an Austin chapter, Sacramento, Seattle just opened up, Denver, I think Hampton Roads has one. Um, I, I know I'm missing some, but off the top of my head, I'd like to say any of the major cities that have like a strong military population are most likely going to have a chapter. Typically with the process, it's you're going to go through the national team. So Phil Bryan and Kevin and a handful of others uh, sit on the national side. And just like any good military affiliated organization, we have a charter, we have processes, we have documentation. So there's a set of guidelines and um, just things that the founders hope every single chapter follows, which is just, it all comes back to the whole idea of ensuring that this is meant for making connections and not anything else. It's because we're always trying to protect the brand, protect the members and keep it so that it's, um, it's meant for connecting people and it's for employment. But uh, ultimately, you would reach out on the uh, to the national website. So it's uh, veteranspiritclub.com. And there should be a link on there. I want to say it's nationalvbc at gmail.com. But if you definitely Google the website, it is definitely on the website for sure, uh, the email address that you would need to email them. But it's a really straightforward process. It's not meant to be complicated. And then the opportunity is definitely there if anyone wants to start a chapter up. So there's a uh, no membership fee. There's nothing like that. It's essentially um, show up, be ready to um, partake in some great beverages and some great um, company with other fellow veterans. And like you also mentioned, there's non-veterans there that also want to um, help out veterans or have opportunities that they're seeking uh, veterans or um, veteran members for. So. That that was that was really cool there. What's uh what what exactly um when you became a veteran and yes, you found the VBC and you talked a little bit about veterati, um, but what was it like getting out? Um and 2017, that was that was kind of a um kind of a weird time as well because we were we were dealing with a lot of the uh, financial stuff for at least for the military and government what what was that like getting out in that time frame uh so i underestimated how difficult it would be um i i made the assumption that i can just hop on an interview and ace it and be done with it uh so i 
It's also service warfare officer. So coming out as an officer, a lot of, a lot of the guidance that I got was you'll be fine. You're an officer. You you've led people. You've managed projects. Like it's a complete shoe in. Uh, so I still remember going through. A friend of mine recommended um, one of the head hunting companies. So I went through them, and I just remember kind of being thrown into an interview, and throwing out acronyms, terminology. And half the time, I'm like, this person has no idea what I'm saying. So I think I kind of got thrown into the fire, to be honest, as a lot of trial and error, a lot of uh, kind of like what we're doing now, a lot of Zoom interviews where you can kind of see like the face gloss over and it's clear that they have no idea what I'm saying and halfway through, they're losing interest. But um, yeah, it was through just things like Veterati, people helping me, um, a lot of strong mentors who essentially were like, do this, don't do that, say this, that doesn't make any sense, use this term, uh, change this to this business term. So it was a ton, a ton, a ton of coaching, a ton of mentorship, a ton of trial and error. And I'm sure I could have not gone through that much trial and error and save myself a lot of time, but it's made me a better mentor to other veterans. But ultimately, I think just through attending different programs, reaching out to people and kind of getting rid of that ego of, I know what I'm doing, I can figure it out. And just being willing to ask for help, things worked out. And attending multiple of your, of your um, events, that is, I can tell you, one of the biggest things that I've noticed um, that makes connections successful just like you said get out of your own head start talking to people and you know sometimes we have good days sometimes we have bad days i remember the last one actually for me your anniversary it was an awesome event a lot of people that was an actual bad day for me not because of the event i just i was not having a good day uh i get it, I get it. yeah and i was able to even then i was still some of the people that I've already talked to before came and like, dude, like, what's wrong? Like, this is not you. What's going on? <laughs> I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. Like, I, I'm trying. Like, I'm really trying, but I couldn't get it. But it was the, even then, when you're having a bad day, you still feel like you're part of the group, right? A lot of places, when, you, when you're not fitting that cookie cutter, that um, civilian place mentality, right? They're, you start having a bad day, they're, they're starting pushing away and kind of like get to the back of the room, we don't want to deal with you kind of thing. But it, was, it wasn't like that, you know? And that, that's, that's another thing that I love about the club and how everybody legitimately is there. Obviously, they want to help people. They want to, they're not selling you anything. Mm -hmm. They're giving you, it, it, it's not a salesy thing. It's like, hey, I have these opportunities. If you want them, cool. If you don't want them, that's cool too. You yeah. know, it's there's no pressure at all. There's nothing, and, and that's beautiful. And to have that partnership, that mentorship, and legitimately care uh, has been fantastic. So, um, so let me ask you this: What if you could start it all over? What would be something that you would do before you got out to promote more of this to the active duty members so that they could learn about this? Oh, to learn about BBT? To raise, to, to raise awareness, yes. I think we would have kept it the same. Um, we've, we've been grassroots, word of mouth for for like oh seven eight years now and right i think that's our strength is the fact that i mean like chris said we don't charge anything so i have zero marketing budget I, like i have no food budget i have everything is completely <laughs> goodwill um people giving me stuff for free to work with um we'd honestly just keep it the same it's i think there's something different when is me sending me is you seeing it on a Facebook ad versus your buddy on the ship saying, Hey, you should really, really attend this event. I've been, I really, really like it. 
And I think that continues to be our uh, our value proposition is that we're not doing anything to sell it minus like so like social media to promote the event. It's word of mouth. It's all these reputable organizations in San Diego, transition programs, people raising their hand and saying, oh, wait, I just attended this event. You also check it out. And yeah, we we literally wouldn't change anything. Not not something you could say about many things, but we we do it the exact exactly the same. Yeah, I love that, man, because it's like where Yogi know, was saying he came in on a bad day. And you know what really helps us whenever we have a bad day is other brothers and sisters yeah. that are that have been there like us. And uh when Yogi was talking about that, you know, it popped in a picture of uh, uh another um one of our brothers that was there at the event that i was we were just talking about how he's like man i'm just really having a hard time finding a job man and you know if he, this guy was a legal guy for a while i'm I'm hoping he found the job by now but at that point in time we were just sitting there commiserating and he was like you know but at least like i have this you know because this is this is better than just sitting by myself and drinking, you know, but, and then ends up, we're talking to another like uh top guy in the legal, uh, legal realm um, that was like, Oh yeah, well, Hey, you know, jobs are hiring. So it's like, you never know who you're going to run into at, at these events. And this one legal guy who was not a veteran just came there and was just looking for uh, people to join his organization. So I don't know if that ever amounted to anything, but it just kind of, I remember that happening. Um, bro, like, that's that's the thing, man. Like, a lot of us, you know, get kind of proud. You know, we're like, oh, you know, big, tough sailors or soldiers or Marines. But really, man, we're, we're just as infallible um, as civilians we just don't want them to know that right <laughs> and, and, and you know being top of your game for so long and then having to go into this environment where you're just like damn now i gotta figure out what's next shit and i i, I don't even know what i'm gonna do next like i'm like what am i going to do it's just such a weird uh uh position to be in especially when you're about to um leave being like the top of your game you know and to be in the bottom but one thing you do have an advantage that a very very small population of the u.s has is that the veteran network from my from what i've seen will be any alumni network will be any business chamber local networking group i've i've spoken to veterans at google Meta, top consulting firms, Ivy League schools, and purely our only connection is that we serve together. Doesn't even matter if it's the same branch, the same job description. It it is difficult to transition, but I mean, the group just wants to help, and yeah, everybody is just so that camaraderie still exists outside of the military. And I think the fact that you have access to a network that you can't, you can't, you know, there's no, you can't just pay money to, to get into it. It's, there's a cost associated with it. But once you're in, um, you're in a community forever, a community that really, really wants to see you succeed. What would you say to the um, people who are still in the military, right? That are unaware of the transition process, what would you say to them to bring awareness of how to start transitioning, how to start networking, and how far in advance would you say it's a good timeline? I've had people that I've mentored start um, about a year and a, a year to a year and a half out. And the focus is just chatting with people and networking. It's not, you're not doing resumes, you're not applying for jobs. You're literally just practicing the whole, this is what I do and this is what I'm looking for and seeing if the other person looks at you and understands what you're saying. Cause <laughs> it's just like, 
you know, even if we're both in the same branch, <laughs> even if we're both in the same branch, um, it just because like I can use a term and you may not understand it if we're at different commands, different types of jobs. I've made that mistake myself, but uh, I think just getting that muscle memory and having it so that everybody understands just makes it so much easier. And it's just much easier to network when you're not you're not thinking like, um, I gotta get a job, I gotta apply for something, the, the savings are running out. So I think starting out early, definitely makes it easier but then you also get to just you know when you're chatting with someone and it's just like really like light and airy and there's no agenda you're not focused on anything it's just like we're just here to build a connection I think you get that if you start really early um a couple of the programs that exist out there I think there's like a timeline where there's like Skillbridge or Vet Tech so I think if you start a little bit early a year out you can at least get a sense of like okay these are all this is what I need to do. This is the timelines. These are deadlines. You can kind of play around with it. But I think as, as long as you build yourself a little bit of a runway, you have your time to build up your LinkedIn profile, make multiple chops of your resume, build a presence out there. Um, we've been talking about BBC the whole time and showing up and kind of becoming familiar with people. I think a lot of that, you know, it just takes time. Um, it's kind of tough to show up to an event once and then expect everybody to know you. But, you know, you start showing up to these events and everyone's like, oh, hey, you know, oh, yeah, I remember you're looking for this job. Or I remember you did this. And you kind of build that rapport. And before you know it, you see you go to this other networking event. You're like, oh, wait, you're at this one, too. I didn't know you attend this one. So having that little bit of a gap in early on, I think, allows you to have that freedom to, you know, make errors figure out what you don't want to do, and most importantly, figure out what you want to do. And that was going to be something else that I was going to ask you or mention, because a lot of us is like, hey, well, I don't want to go network because I don't know what I want to do. Because everybody always asks me, well, what do you want to do? And I haven't figured that out, right? I still get it. Yeah, I still right. get it. Yeah. <laughs> but just like you mentioned, I mean, it's not about that. The whole purpose is about building a connection because yeah. you don't know where that connection is going to take you. You don't even know how, when at the least moment, the least person that you think would be, will end up becoming the most valuable person in your life going forward. It's, and it's crazy because, you know, I think about BBC and that came up with just me reaching out to someone for help, never thinking that it was going to turn out to this. Um, I do like nonprofit work in the, in the community and that came from a, a mentor I met through a program years ago who thought of me and we just, we just kept in contact. I, I mean, I can't think of one opportunity that I have in my life today that I specifically planned for. It was all through kind of putting myself out there and then just setting myself up to where when the timing was right, things really, really worked out. Um, and it's tough. I mean, I, you know, I always think about this with uh, the BBC leads. Most of us are actually introverts. We always kind of chuckle about it because there's definitely moments where like, um, I think I need to skip this month because I'm, my social battery is like low, low, and I cannot be in a host mode right now. But I think through time, we've all figured out how to, how to do this whole networking thing that doesn't, to where it doesn't completely exhaust us. So uh, you mentioned like the Skillbridge program a little bit earlier, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't want to start working my separation stuff until I get a little bit closer to separation. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. If you wait, especially for the Skillbridge program where you need to have an idea of what you're doing pretty much a year out, wow. uh, because a lot of commands essentially, like as soon as you hit that year mark, they're like, hey, buddy. Uh, if you wanted skill bridge, you better like tell us about it like ASAP. And you know, you can't even apply for it uh more than 365 days out from your expected separation for the Navy. I'm pretty sure the rest of the DOD is the same way. And 
but a lot of the commands are like, well, we want to know about it via a special request chat before your uh, your year process. So that that whole entire skill bridge uh, program is such a great way to figure out what you want to do when you get out. Um, and there's there's thousands and thousands of opportunities. And a lot of those types of places are going to um, networking events and they're talking to veter uh, to military that are separating. Like, hey, uh, yeah, come check out Booz Allen. We have a program. Come check out Boeing. We have a program. Come check out Home Depot. We have a program. I went through a program called Veteran PCS and I was able to um, work on my real estate stuff. Nice. And- yeah talk with other realtors and get my stuff all situated. So that way I knew for sure that I wanted to be that, or I didn't want to be that you're either going to get, you know, it kind of gives you a, a, a little cheat sheet on what you're going to, you're going to do when you get out. And a lot of people are like, well, the skill bridge program is going to die. I, I don't think it's going to die. I think, uh, I think some changes are going to happen to it to safeguard the military and to also safeguard the people that are going to be using um skill bridge so i I know they're 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 clamping down a little bit on it but they're also wanting to make sure that people utilize it correctly so um when you got out um did you use any of those programs skill bridge at the time i i think either wasn't being heavily promoted um at the time so i just didn't know if it was an option the program saw it so i kind of like did the fire hose method and just signed up for everything um i mentioned metarati i've used the commit foundation um they had this program and i'll i'll, I'll make these brief or else we'll be talking forever about programs but commit foundation has, has a event i think in the fall in silicon valley so they bring together tech companies, venture capitalists, for people who are interested in tech. Um, I did breakline. So like initially the early stages of breakline, I did uh, breakline finance. Um, just like how we talked about knowing what you want to do, I realized I don't want to be in finance. Um, <laughs> uh, did a ton of veterati, ton of interventional interviews. Uh, Travis Manning Foundation, another nonprofit, had this uh, one to two day uh, workshop. So met met people in um, in construction, consulting, and a couple other fields. Um, that's all I remember off the top of my head at the moment. But essentially, whatever I had time for, whatever fit the schedule, I just the goal was just to meet people, try everything, figure out what works. Um, I never thought VBC would be the the one that made everything work out, but I think as a result of doing different things and practicing the elevator pitch and getting resume, getting resumes reviewed, edited, polishing up the LinkedIn, I think I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't just being open-minded and trying all these different programs to see what stuck and what would work out. You know, um, I do want to point out to everybody, uh, Will just got recently hired on uh, with the government. So yeah, yeah. your new position. Um, so what, what what jobs did you get getting out? Like, what was it? What was it like getting a job and like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then moving on from there. What was that like? Um, a lot of it was initially through the headhunting through the headhunting um, group. So I'm trying to think of what, what it was. Sales, a lot of sales roles, um, manufacturing. I remember getting this on-site interview with this, um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, salad dressing and barbecue sauce get made, but it was this small town. They flew me into this small town. I think I took a... Like I took a rental car, drove into the small town, like population a thousand or something, and did a tour of a salad dressing plant. So it would have been like a third or fourth shift, I think. Like one of the ones where you're waking up at 10 p.m. and going into work and getting off early in the morning. 
that was one of the first offers I got, but I was just like, I really can't do this. Um, there's a couple other different um, project management roles that I wanted that I wasn't getting. Uh, one of those Amazon warehouse area manager roles came up. Um, luckily that didn't work out because I now I know about what it's like working in a Amazon warehouse. It's just not for me. Sorry, man. You would have died in a cubicle somewhere and then they would just stack paper or Amazon boxes <laughs> and then make everybody just, else just get me out two day prime. <laughs> oh, don't worry, guys. We're just we're just storing Amazon boxes in the cubicles for now. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> the factory, the warehouses are cool though, but it's um yeah. It, it 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 is not. It, it's for. It's not for everybody. I'll I'll I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, but I yeah, I am perfectly fine being in a cubicle, sitting in front of a computer, and not being in a in a warehouse. But yeah, a little bit of everything. I. I mean, if you ask me like what I want to do now, I think I'm still kind of figuring out. Over time, I've narrowed it down a bit, but. You know, like I just went through like I guess a second transition going into the this government role. And I still got that question over and over again. I I'm you know, it's not like I don't I don't have this down perfectly. My default answer is still project management just because I have all the certifications, I can do it and it's been fine. But um, you know, I I do think that the whole transition process never ends. It's just something you you continue continuously refine. I think. Over time, I've definitely had a different mindset between, I think, what is the saying? Living to work or working to live? I think at the moment, I'm fine working to live and then having just a really solid social life, hot and hobby that's out of work. That may change a little bit later on in a different stage of life, but I think that's kind of like where my head's at right now. So since you mentioned the certifications, can you tell us about what certifications you have uh, and that mostly because you mentioned about the project management right because yeah. a lot of us we think that we automatically fall into the category of you know i'm a chief i'm a senior nco i'm an officer i can do project management no problem right what is the reality when it comes to the civilian sector and that there's i think at a high level maybe but there's so many additional additional um, processes, tools, um, budgeting aspects to it that it's highly unlikely you're doing it in the, in the military. Um, I don't think it's a big stretch. I think it's definitely learnable. I know a lot of service members have transitioned into it, but at the same time, I've also met a lot of people who transitioned to it and were like, nope, <laughs> this is not what I want to do. Um, maybe a controversial take. I, I think it's doable if, if you really, really want to do it. I don't think the gap is that big, but it may not be as easy as you think it is because there are certain nuances to just how government budgets work that are completely different from um, non-federal type companies and roles and then that fur further gets more more complicated depending on where the money is coming from how is the money being used what industry is it so i think i don't think it's bad advice but sometimes it's sold as hey you've done this before if you get the certification you're a shoe in and i don't think that's the case uh, oh, you asked about what certifications I have. Um, I did, I mean, most of the stuff I've done is like textbook transition stuff. So got the PMP, uh, got the Scrum Master recently, um, got my uh, Excel expert certification, uh, got certified in Tableau, um, and I've done a couple like coding classes on the side. But uh, I think the ones that actually hold weight, in my opinion, have been more of like the analytical type courses. Um, Scrum Master hasn't really done anything yet. 
Uh, PMP has helped for a couple project manager roles. So if you really, really want to do that path, I think it's still a door opener. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a time commitment, but um, I've still seen it come up on job descriptions, job postings. So it's not a complete wash unless if that is not what you want to do whatsoever, then you're better off putting your time somewhere else. What got you looking into becoming a PMP and getting your Scrum Master and all that? Uh, so initially, a lot of this was when I was Alan. And being a consultant, part of it is being billable, uh, being able to be on different types of contracts. And with the government, there's different types of stipulations, requirements to do certain types of work. And having those additional certifications, whether it's like advanced degrees, certifications, makes you a more marketable consultant. So at least for the consulting side and on the government side, if they're like, hey, these are, this is a job description, these are requirements, I can kind of go down and start to checking off boxes. Um, doesn't mean that you're proficient at everything, but it means you have the certification. Um, so that's kind of like the path that I initially started off on. What I've been kind of pivoting to is the um, kind of like the analytical side, the business, the uh, the ad visualization side kind of piqued my interest just because it's pretty applicable. So that's kind of like where I've been pushing to uh, on the side and with like little side projects. But uh, yeah, I mean, Booz Allen, like many companies will pay for certification. So in my mind, it was just, if the money's there, I, I better use it. And I did as, as much as I could. Try, I tried learning as much as I possibly could from, from everybody and, you know, anything I can get my hands on, I was trying to commit, try to commit to memory and understand it and apply it. So all I'm hearing is that since you've been out and before you even got out, you kept this mindset of, let me work on what's next and how can I keep on improving myself? How can I stay busy? What can I do to not only enjoy my current self, but actually set my future self up for success, right? Not knowing entirely what that future self was going to be up for, but it's like, hey, I'll take this, I'll take that, I'll take everything. One of this is eventually going to pan out, right? And I mean, it has for everything, uh, all intents and purposes. So that's awesome, man. What would be some advice that you would give to someone that finds themselves in, um, in a junior role, right, mm -hmm. with a little bit of time on their hands, mm -hmm. um, that but they use the excuse, oh well, you know, life is so hard, or uh, I'm always busy. What would you tell them, or how would you try to coach them along those lines so that they can prepare themselves for that transition out? If if they came up to me, I think we'd probably start off by looking at where's the time going um so this is not me bragging but i mean i'm doing i'm working full time i'm going to school part time i'm i'm doing bbc i'm doing nonprofit board work somehow fitting fitting in an exercise of social life and attempting to date here and there and catch up with family um so and i know people who who do even more like people who have kids who um are taking their kids, you know, to the clinic on the weekend and then baseball practice while going to school, while working full time. So it's tough. I guess it's tough when I hear that argument because maybe it's the people I surround myself with, but everybody's hustling, everybody's pushing. So I think a big thing for me would be looking at where time's going. Like, where are you investing your time? Uh, what are you doing outside of work? What are you doing on the weekends? It's, you may, you may have to sacrifice a little bit of time um, on the side, maybe to pick up a certification, find a mentor. But I think there's this, there's books on it and this is the I read for fun, but understanding, um, I think it's an I word, but it's uh, understanding what motivates people, I think is really important. So if it's a, a junior employee and there's a why behind it, maybe, 
they can't find time, but the reason why they want to excel is because they want to buy a home or they want they want to pay off debt. They need to support a spouse, a kid. I think trying to really, really understand the motivation or the reason behind it, um, I think would help them prioritize more time towards those efforts and um, figure things out. Because I know, I know people who, who play video games when they get home or um, they have different side hobbies. And I think there's a way to do both. Sometimes you may have to flex a little bit, but it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just what people are doing on the side. It's just everyone I surround myself with, they're doing something on the it's a side hustle, it's a job, a business, going to school, go, doing a certification. It's definitely doable. Um, I see people do it all the time. It's not easy, but yeah, it, it, always, it always pans out. That's not easy being cheesy, man. <laughs> the uh, experience that you had coming from the Navy to where you're at today, what what would you say that most veterans have um, that with your experience working inside the civilian workforce, what experience or what is it that veterans bring that the competition out there just doesn't have? I think, um, so one is the, the basics are there. So you may not, a lot of the things that we think are common, whether it's showing up on time, dressing appropriately, um, mannerisms, office, like the way you conduct yourself in office, the way you present, the way you interact with senior leadership, um, different types of coworkers or managed people, all of that's there. And you can't buy it, you can't learn it from school, it's, you, it's on the job learning. And all veterans have it. Um, I remember showing up to like a first meeting, being 10 minutes early, and the only other two people that were 10 minutes early were also veterans. Everybody else came in late and the presentation started and like the, the, pres the person presenting, you know, they do like a little death stare when a person walks in late. But it's like little things like that because you notice, like um, you notice when people are punctual, punctual it's, um, I chatted with other coworkers where, you know, we show up, we um, dry run the brief the day before you make sure all the, uh, like the, does the laptop connect? The, is PowerPoint working? Is it saved correctly? Not everybody does it. Some people are fumbling around the day of the brief and everything's just complete chaos, but there's this sense of so-and-so's, you know, really, really polished. It's good. They've got it down. Um, I think work ethic, the work ethic is there. I, I think for the majority of veterans that want to, you know, make a difference, do well in the world, make an impact and work hard is there. I don't know if that will continue to exist throughout all generations, but there is a sense of hard work ethic that is there that I think I really, really admire where you put, you know, you, you put, you put a problem out there and somehow it will get solved. If it means spend some extra hours on it, re reading the manual, doing some Google searches, figuring out, um, I've definitely met coworkers who were like, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do. This is not my job. Um, like, you know, people start freaking out and they get flustered. But for me, I mean, a common thing has just been, at least with past supervisors, they know if they give me something, even if it's not part of my job, I'll, it generally is like, we'll, 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 we'll can probably figure it out. And, and I have, it's just, I don't know how you teach that. I don't, I don't. I don't know, like, it's not a certification, it's not a book. It's just something that kind of like, for better or for worse, gets forced upon you in the military. And these are little qualities that really, really, I think, make you stand out, especially with the generation that are in senior leadership right now, because that same worth ethic for them to get up there to that level, um, generally is through hard work and <laughs> um, generally it's through hard work. So it's just, um, I think they, they connect with it and, and yeah, it, 
it's there. I think as long as you, as long as veterans get the chance to show to show that or to tell that story, I think once you're in, you're golden. You know, I, so, I really think it's the uh, hold my beer persona. <laughs> so, I, since, since professional Chris, terminology, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, but I wanna I wanna make sure that we can capture this because July twenty fifth is higher a uh, national or higher veterans day. So would love to have you blast it over social, social media, do a little short about what you just did. You just said a little short synopsis of why should any company hire a veteran? Go. So you have these skills, these completely intangible skills for veterans uh, within veter within the veteran network within the veteran population and that's really really strong leadership skills um a lot of like emotional intelligence but i think the main thing that really really stands out is the work ethic it's a, a population who's been put under pressure who's been put under different environments different types of people and i've been told figure it out and i think time and time again as you meet more and more veterans you're going to see all veterans figure it out. Whether it's this problem that's never happened before, something that's not associated with their job, you get this really, really unique perspective of no problem, I, I'll get it done. And I that's something that you may not necessarily get within your population, but within the veteran population, you're gonna get that. And that carries across all teams, functions, and it's only gonna help the company, team, group, what it, wherever they're associated with. I love it, man. Hey, I can't let you get out of here without telling me a good sea story, bro. So <laughs> let, let me get a let me get a good sea story. There's this one. Um, there's this one that one of my sailors always give me shit for, and he's still a good friend. He's actually we're really good. We we, we hang out more now than. That we did before, but um, we were we're in Esquimalt, Canada, and um, the, the Liberty bus was coming by to to pick us all up to take us back to the ship, and so it was a late night. We've been out for a little bit, and I like look in the back of the bus, and I see someone with one of those. It's one of those hats you would see like in um almost like an Asian cartoon where it's like a it's like in the triangle. I call them like rice paddy hats, but essentially, <laughs> like, I was just like, like sunshade, man. Come yeah. on, I, do, I know, I know, not politically correct. Um, I, I'm probably not gonna. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna that's not not good for the company. Uh, that's not, yeah, not representing a company here. But I just remember like yelling, like, "Who's wearing that? Like, that's completely disrespectful." And then he's like, "Hey, sir, it's me." And I was like, "Oh my god, it's one of my guys," and. Yeah, he he's known for collecting a hat at every port call. So they're like, he collects the most goofiest hats. They were like all over the, um, the work center. Uh, I think there was like a Harry Potter sorting hat from Japan, but it's just, yeah. He's like the goofiest guy, but one of my hardest working sailors from back in the day. And he always gives me crap for it because um, after every port call, I'd be like, like what'd you pick up this time? And it's always just something completely off the wall. I'm like, of course you'd pick that up. But phenomenal guy. We we hang out all the time. And one one of my closest friends post Navy. I love that man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're like, hey, what are you doing? Uh, I, I didn't know who it was. It's like completely pitch black. And I hear the voice. I'm like, oh, I, I know. The, the things that sailors collect at port calls, right? Oh man, everyone has their uh their niece for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. So uh I think we should uh head over into the save rounds and alibis. Does anybody have anything else? All right, cool. Final round. All right, man. So for the save round and alibi, uh, my question that I have for you. Do you have any books or podcasts that you recommend veterans or military that are in the transitioning and reintegrating process 
to digest while they transition? So I have, I have two. Um, I brought copies with me, so there's no mistaking it. So um, about three years ago, actually, one of the um, mentors reached out to me about contributing to a book. And so it's, um, I don't know if it'll come out right, but Success After Service, the a little bit of Zoom blur, but uh, you, can, you can find it online. Uh, she essentially took the top 10, 15 mentors on Veterati, completely different functions, companies, backgrounds, and then just took all their advice and put it into a book. Um, I mean, I'm in it, so it's obviously good. But it, it's a good book. It it's essentially covers everything from beginning to end. And just, I mean, a lot of people who contribute to the book are my own mentors. So the advice there is really, really sound. And you don't see this coming up in a lot of um, transition programs or book lists. The other one is the, the first 90 days. Oh, Zoom blur. There we go. The first 90 days. Um, so what I thought was really unique about this is that people don't actually talk about office dynamics and office politics. So what this does is it kind of categorizes, all right, you're in this job, you don't know anybody, you have work that's doing, that's upcoming, you know, who are the, strategically, who are the people that you should get to know quickly and early on? To, to best make an impact and kind of make it make a difference within your new role. So I think both books are great. Um, podcast wise, I think if you're just new to transition and you haven't been looking at any anything when it comes to business, I think any of the um, any of the podcasts on businesses, how businesses are run, the economy, just to give you any baseline of how companies make money, how companies hire, what is HR process like, I think would be great. Um, I've always recommended uh, Beyond the Uniform. Uh, they, do, they do a lot of uh, military, military transition interviews, also a great one. But yeah, I think any of those would be, um, would, would set you up pretty well. So I have two questions for you. They're similar, but in two different timelines, right? Um, okay. What would you do? What advice would you give yourself before you join the military to prepare you for the military process and also to prepare you for the transition out? And then the second question is, what advice would you give yourself and how early would you give it to yourself to start transitioning out? So prior to joining the military, if I went back in time, um, one thing that was not really passed on to me, but something I've been really, really focusing on is personal finance. Whether that's saving for retirement, uh, saving for a rainy day, and just being smart with money. Um, that wasn't something my parents really pushed on me, and that's a regret of mine throughout my time in service, not taking advantage of, not understanding taxes, BAH, the TSP funds. So I think going back in time, I would have put more time into understanding how to best invest money and save money. Um, I don't know if I could have advised myself on, so I, I commissioned through OCS. Honestly, it was pretty crappy. There's no amount of words would have cushioned that experience. Um, looking back at this transition, if I could have started a year a year out, I think that would have been better, whether it was just talking to people, getting the, the narrative down, getting some resources, and just not having having more time and not feeling rushed would have, would have been great. So I think a year, worst case, six months out, I think any of that would have been better. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I would do. So talking about mindset, when you were transitioning out 
how did you manage your mindset to keep yourself going forward? If, you know, like, just like what you talked about, what we talked about with um, some days you're just not feeling it. It was, it was my mentors. It was scheduling calls, having that person to listen to me. It, you, you know, that generic, uh, thanks for applying, but we're going to look at other candidates' email or never hearing back. Reject, rejection in any form doesn't feel good. And then you're investing a lot of time into the process. And it's not, it doesn't always feel good to not reap any results. And for me, it was this like really, really core group of people who, who uh, sometimes there really wasn't any advice. Sometimes they're just listening and reminding me that you're going to be fine. Things will work out. Um, so for me, it was being vulnerable, being open to telling people, Hey, this sucks, or this isn't working out the way I wanted to. And having them sit down with me, talk things through, reevaluate through, come up with a new plan. And through that process, I continue to push and push and push. And then things worked out. Um, yeah, it, it's a support network that, that happened. It's the support network through this that first transition is a support network through this most recent one into the new role but i think having that core group of people is like absolutely essential well we want to thank you for coming here for sharing your experience for sharing your knowledge and for continuing to do what you're doing for the group. It is honestly um, very difficult for military members that transition out to continue giving back, right? We would say that a lot of them just kind of, it's not that they forget and move on, but because they're in such a rush moving forward that they want to forget about that time of their life because it is very difficult, right? Um, and they do come back and they help, but it is, it, it's difficult and challenging. But in a way, you you went through your transition and you continue going forward and you continue to pay back. So thank you. And thank you for sharing all the work. How can our uh, members uh, get a hold of you? And how can, if they want to contact the Veterans uh, Beer Club or what can they do to get a hold of you or the team? Yeah, uh, so I should know the, our, our Instagram by memory, but I do not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I am very active on LinkedIn. At least I check it now. I'm, I'm kind of Don't taking worry. It, but... Everybody now knows uh, he does not know the VBC Instagram. Off <laughs> hey, uh, but I manage it, so I check it. <laughs> if you wear a sunshade around him, he's going to yell at you and say that. Okay. You're really <laughs> <laughs> uh bbc underscore san diego is uh our instagram i'm one of the handful of people that check it um veteranspiritclub.com for veteran spirit club um you can look us up on eventbrite that also works too but any of those i think would be the bet with the best options um oh we're on linkedin as well i mean generally all social media platforms minus fred with that new one that uh meta came out oh, the with, one that they just came TikTok. out <laughs> yeah so don't reach out on thread or tiktok because that doesn't exist <laughs> or, or other or they're portraying us um for me i think linkedin's the best uh william lou the one in san diego uh i mean trying to think I don't, I don't know if i have i think i got the url before anybody else did so i'm almost positive i am the own i am i am william dash lou on, on LinkedIn. I got it before anybody else did. So no numbers, but LinkedIn, William Das Lou. Um, I'm not, I'm taking a break a little bit from the volunteering because the plate's full, but more than happy to do introductions, resume reviews, um, and just any anything I can do to help. Uh, I wouldn't be a good board member if I wasn't plugging the, the Armed Services Y. So I'm a board member for the Armed Services Y um they do they do food drives 
educational programs, day camp, summer camp for primarily junior enlisted service members. So they help fulfill that need, whether it's um, you, whether it's a uh, summer program, stay camp, uh, everything is bare, like super affordable. It's meant to be affordable. It's meant to help fulfill that gap, that need. Um, they have a lot of incredible events with toy drives and it's just awesome organization. I've been a part of it for like a year and a half, but in general, I'm really well connected here in San Diego, um, a little bit in Texas. But anything I can do to help, I'm, I don't have, nothing I have today isn't a result of someone helping me out. So I'm going to continue to pay it forward, uh, continue to help. So I'm always, I, as everyone I've worked with will confirm, um, I'm always here to help, always here to support, and I'll, I'll give as much as I can. Yeah, hey, brother, thank you for coming on, everybody. We got um, Will Lou. He talked about his service after service and pretty much just keep hustling and hustling and hustling and not just not just being the status quo. He talked about how he got some certifications, a lot of certifications. And not only that, he spent uh, a lot of time volunteering with other community projects, becoming board members for projects and stuff like that. So this is a prime example of what to do. Just keep working at it over and over and over again. To everybody in the military to vet or mill to vet return to roots uh, group, it is your transition. So take charge of it. Return to roots out.